a live recording of Libertarianism.org's Free Thoughts podcast. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Our guest today is Jason Riley. He's a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a columnist for the Wall Street Journal. His new book is Maverick, a biography of Thomas Sowell, which we will discuss today. We'll have some time after our discussion for questions from the audience. You can send them to us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, and be sure to use the hashtag Cato Events. Thank you for joining us today, Jason. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. Can you give us a sense of what Sowell's early life was like? Uh, sure. He was um, He's going to be 91 years old later this month. He was born in, in, in North Carolina, outside of Charlotte, in 1930. So this is the Depression era. It's the Jim Crow South. Uh, it was extreme poverty. Um, he uh, was orphaned as, as a toddler, never knew his father, who died before he was born. And his mother died in childbirth to a younger sibling. So he didn't know his parents. He was taken in by a, a great aunt who uh, uh, had two adult children, and, and she moved the family when Tom was nine up to New York City's Harlem neighborhood, and that's where he was raised. Um, he uh, was a bright kid, but he had rather tumultuous uh, home life, ended up uh, uh, dropping out of high school and then leaving home at the age of 17 and uh, uh, working a bunch of menial jobs uh, for a while until he was drafted into the Marines during the Korean War. And that's when he sort of started to turn his life around. He was able to uh, go to college on the GI Bill. He started at Howard University, the black school in D.C. And then he transferred to Harvard, where he completed his uh, undergraduate degree at uh, the age of 28 years old. <laughs> it's quite remarkable how late a start he got. Um, he didn't write his first book until he was 40. And you think of how prolific he's been. Uh, given that late start, uh, you can only imagine how much more prolific he would have been, and he had a more traditional uh, route uh, of, a, of a scholar and an intellectual. Uh, for most of the 60s and 70s, um, um, he taught uh, after earning his graduate degree under um, Milton Friedman and George Stigler at the University of, of Chicago. He taught for, for most of the 60s and 70s, um, and then uh, moved over to the Hoover Institution at Stanford University in 1980. And, and that's where he's been uh, as a senior fellow uh, ever since. It's, I mean, obviously everyone's background uh, influences their, their intellectual t t beliefs to some extent, but I think for Thomas Sowell, like it's pretty profound how his background you just sort of laid out, like how did that, can you kind of say like when he views the nature of sort of economic well-being and how someone makes it in the world, like it seems very influenced by the way that he did it uh, in his own particular way? Yes. A personal experience um, plays an important role in, um, in Sol's intellectual development uh, and how he approaches uh, economics and other areas he's written in education, history, um, uh, the role of intellectuals in society. Um, culture, uh, racial controversies, and so forth. Yes, he's often drawing from uh, personal experience. He said that, you know, these are things he experienced firsthand. He didn't simply read about them in a book or hear about them uh, third hand. Um, and yes, that has had a, a, a tremendous uh, impact on, on, on his scholarship. He's been quite, quite upfront about that. Uh, he started out on the left, um, which in and of itself is not all that unusual for someone who later on goes on to become a conservative. You know, Milton Friedman started out on the left. Uh, Ronald Reagan started out on the left. And, and it's particularly um, true for a lot of black conservatives who, who not only start out you know, slightly left of center, but, um, you know, Tom was a Marxist. Um, you know, Clarence Thomas was a Black Panther. Walter Williams, uh, another libertarian economist, um, was far more sympathetic to the views of, of Malcolm X than he was to the views of Martin Luther King. Uh, Shelby Steele was, was a black radical leftist in the 1960s. So, so um, I, find that, I find that interesting um, how, far, how far to the left some of these guys start out, particularly among the, um, the black conservatives. But yes, Tom, Tom started out on, on, on the left. Um, and even after studying at, at the University of Chicago under Milton Friedman, under George Stigler, who were his mentors, 
Tom remained a Marxist uh, throughout his 20s. And again, getting back to your point about personal experience, it wasn't sitting in front of uh, Milton Friedman hearing his lectures that changed Tom's mind about socialism. It was a job working in the government uh, in the early 1960s in the Department of Labor uh, and studying minimum wage laws and their impacts on employment, particularly employment of uh, disadvantaged groups, minority groups. And Tom realized um, they were having harmful employment effects, that there are trade-offs involved here. And moreover, that the government didn't quite, didn't really care. Um, it, it had its own agenda. Uh, agenda. And, um, and the actual effects of these policies mattered less than the intentions of these policies. And that, that sort of set off alarm bells for Tom about um, uh, socialism and, and just uh, th this idea that government was everywhere and always a benevolent influence on, on the lives, particularly the lives of the disadvantaged. He, 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 it caused him to rethink that. And that is what began his journey to, towards free markets and as, as a better way, uh, a better approach than, uh, than big government. I stay on the Marxism for a moment because I think it's, it's a really interesting part of his, his intellectual history, I suppose. And Tom Sowell is not the kind of person who just stumbles into beliefs or accepts them willy-nilly. And so there must have been something about Marxism at, at like a deep level that really drew him if he stuck to it for as long as he did and he stuck to it in the face of studying with people like Milton Friedman. So what was that and do, are there still, I mean, he ultimately rejected Marxism, sure, but are there aspects of that that have influenced his ongoing thinking or scholarship? Well, the, the reason he found Marx appealing, he says, um, is because Marx explained the world around him at the time. He stumbled onto Marx in his late teens, uh, picked up a secondhand copy of encyclopedias and, and noticed an entry on Marx. And he was sort of self-taught. He, he, he studied this on his own in his late teens. Um, and he, he, he tells the, the story of, of working as a messenger for Western Union. So this is the 1940s. Um, and uh, the office was located in lower Manhattan. And uh, some days after work, he'd ride the bus home to Harlem. So which is basically the, the whole length of the island of Manhattan. So he'd get on this bus and it would go up, up through Wall Street and then it would, uh, you would go through the expensive shopping districts past Saks Fifth Avenue. And then it would go on down uh, by Carnegie Hall and then up Riverside Drive, another sort of well-to-do residential neighborhood. And then he would cross this viaduct and there would be the tenements, there would be the ghetto and he'd get off. And that's where he lived. And he would say to himself, what just happened? Why does this look like this up here versus what I just uh, saw on my ride home? And he said, Marx explained it. <laughs> Mark, Marx said, here's what's happening. <laughs> you and people like you are being exploited by all the people who live in those communities and shop in those communities, you just rode past on the bus. And it made a certain logical sense to him. And it's something that um, he found a, an attractive uh, uh, perspective. And, and, it's, and it's something he clung to until he um, uh, uh, had convinced himself that it was the wrong way to go. And that involved a combination of, of study and of personal, personal experience uh, that, that so, but, but that's what, he, you know, he just says it, 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 um, it offered a, a very attractive explanation of what was going on, not just for him personally, but for black people as a group at that time. Uh, this was a very attractive ideology. Um, and, 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 and Tom was taken in by it initially. Uh, so you talked, we mentioned the University of Chicago, which of course is extremely important uh, when he went there and the kind of ideas that were flowing around the University of Chicago. Um, but can you elaborate a little bit on the kind of people that were there uh, and what he was learning? I mean, we obviously have Milton Friedman and George Stickler uh, and probably not many Marxists on staff, I would, I would imagine, uh, at the University of Chicago. But like, what did he, when he left the University of Chicago, um, what did he take away from that? And, and where did he go immediately sure, after? Sure. Yeah, well, it wasn't just Friedman and Stigler. Uh, Tom studied under, under Hayek. Hayek was still teaching at Chicago when Tom was there. And Tom took his course in the history of ideas. And um, 
So there, there was, you know, there, these were giant, you know, under, um, he, he studied under Walter Burns at uh, Columbia, where he got his master's degree in economics. And Stigler had been at Columbia. John, Tom, Tom went to Chicago not to study under Friedman. He went there to study under Stigler. And Stigler was initially at Columbia. So Tom had planned to get his PhD there at Columbia under Stigler. Stigler then moved to Chicago and Tom followed him. Um, but that's how Tom ended up at, 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 at Chicago. Um, but yeah, there, there were a lot of economic giants uh, uh, walking around, uh, walking through Tom's life. He studied under uh, uh, Gary Becker at, at Columbia as well um, before Becker moved to Chicago. So he, he was surrounded by these great minds who also recognized something in Tom, notwithstanding his Marxism. Burns is the one who gave him that recommendation to be accepted at at uh, at the University of Chicago, he got in on Burns's recommendation. You know, there was a, a time during his graduate studies when he was um, struggling financially to a point where he was considering dropping out of graduate school and getting a job. And um, it was uh, Milton Friedman and George Stigler who went to uh, the Earhart Foundation and secured a grant for him that allowed him to to finish. His studies and go on to become an economist. So this was this Marxist kid, and they knew he was a Marxist. Yet they saw some talent there, and um, and took it upon themselves not only to mentor him intellectually, but uh, uh, to 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 care for his you know material needs so that he could continue as an economist. And there's a funny story where the head of the Earhart Foundation said, you know, um, Stigler and, and Friedman come to us, say fund somebody. That's good enough for us. We fund them. And he says, I remember what they said about Seoul. They said, they said, he's a Marxist now, but he's too smart to stay one. <laughs> I mean, so, so they saw something in him, uh, even when he was spouting his Marxism in, 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 in the sixties, uh, 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 on, on their watch, you know? So, so, um, uh, I, I think it, 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 it speaks to both, um, uh, speaks well of both Stigler and and uh, and Friedman that that they could see past that that there was some real raw talent here um and 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 eventually it would it would uh come to to dominate his thinking um what he really also got out of out of Chicago um two things uh, th that empiricism I mean Tom would probably argue that he brought that mindset with him to Chicago and there's you know, I, I, I believe him. I believe that he, he sort of, that's the way he thought, He's, he, that he thought that way for a long time. You know, facts, data, evidence, show it to me. Um, and, and so he brought that to, to Chicago. They stressed that uh, there, uh, they're, 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 they're less, less interest in, in theoretical, beautiful theoretical models and, and more interest in, in, in data and, and, and evidence. Um, and so uh, he, he certainly, uh, you know, they, they reiterated that approach to economics, and he would take that approach, that empirical approach, uh, with him, whether he was writing about, uh, you know, to, and, and apply it, whether he was writing about economics or writing about intellectual history or writing about uh, cultural issues or racial issues. Tom is an empiricist, uh, and, and he brings an empirical approach to to whatever he's he's doing, and that's certainly something that was stressed at at the Chicago School. The other thing he got. Um, from Chicago and from Stigler and particularly Friedman, I think was the proper role of a public intellectual. Um, uh, after Friedman left teaching, um, uh, after he'd won his Nobel Prize, he, can, he, he then went on to write popular books for, that could be readily understood by people who were not economists. He felt that the role of a scholar was not simply to talk to your peers in the academy in language only they can understand, but to explain your discipline to the average person, uh, to be a sort of economics proselytizer and, and popularizer. And, and Sol certainly took that to heart. He, uh, you know, most of his books um, are written for, for general interest readers and can be understood uh, by people who are not economists or not scholars or not intellectuals. Uh, after he retired his column back in 2016, I wrote that um, some people might have lost the best professor they ever had, even if they never went to college because he is someone who has, has, has taken upon himself to write book after book after book in plain English for the average person to understand. And that is by design. And I think um, part of that came from, um, from studying under Stigler and Milton Friedman who stressed it. 
he first came to wider attention with his writings on the civil rights movement and race issues in America. Did he set out to have that be an area of study? No, no. Tom reluctantly started writing about racial controversies. You know, Tom, Tom is sort of, if, if you can put a label on him, and he kind of rejects the labels, but he, he, he sort of comes out of the classical liberal tradition. His, um, you know, your John Stuart Mill, your Adam Smith, uh, David Ricardo, uh, Malthus, the, these were Tom's uh, influences intellectually. Uh, he wanted to write about economic history and the history of ideas, intellectual history. That was his first love. That's what Stigler was uh, uh, best known for. Um, uh, and that's why he wanted to study under Stigler. Um, he, uh, so, so that's what Tom set out to do. Tom wanted to be a, a, an economics professor, a teacher, a classroom instructor. He wasn't really interested in research. He wanted to be a college professor. Economics had helped explain the world around him. And he wanted to convey some of what he'd learned to other people. That's what he wanted to do, preferably at a small, a small school where he could have personal relationships with, uh, with the students. Um, the problem was that this was the, the 1960s and uh, higher education was changing. Um, uh, students were becoming more radical. You had a civil rights movement. You had a, a women's rights movement. You had a gay rights movement. You had an anti-war movement. And uh, college campuses were used as a platform for all of these activists. And uh, administrators didn't know how to handle it. Um, uh, they, they, they lost track of what the purpose of a university should be. Um, and Tom, Tom wanted to teach the way he had been taught. And that was harder and harder and harder to do beginning in the 1960s. So there were constant run-ins with fellow faculty members, administrators, and so forth where Tom would say, no, you cannot be excused from class to go to a protest. No, we are not gonna spend this entire period talking about current headlines. I'm here to teach economics. You're here to learn economics. And that's what we're gonna discuss. And, and that did not go over well with, um, uh, at, at the schools where he taught. He taught at, uh, at, at Howard University. He taught at uh, Rutgers, Douglas uh, College at Rutgers University. Um, and then by, in, in, the, in the late 60s, he was teaching at Cornell, um, where, of course, you had these armed student protests uh, there in the late 60s. Tom was there for that. And I think that was a real turning point in his attitude toward a, a life in academia. Um, he, he was quite upset and disturbed by how the administrators just capitulated entirely to the students, uh, refused to, to stand up to them. Um, uh, there, were, there were simply no adults. Uh, uh, anywhere to be found, uh, and and this really disturbed Tom. And I and he he stuck it out in teaching through the seventies, but I think he already had one foot out the door. Uh, he was doing some think tank work, and uh, he was take sabbaticals and so forth. So he would go on to teach at Amherst and Brandeis, and he got his uh, tenure at UCLA in the seventies. Um, but I think that that experience at Cornell was uh, formative. Um, and, and really soured him on the direction in which academia was heading and how much he could accomplish there. Um, and, and, and then it was in the 70s that he turned his attention to these racial controversies. For the 60s, he was writing in his discipline. He was writing about Marx. He was writing about uh, uh, John baptiste Say and, and Adam Smith and, 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 and writing about economic history. Um, uh, it was only in the 70s where he really started to turn to writing on race. And he says he did so um, because of the direction that he saw the civil rights movement headed. He thought that they were barking up the wrong tree in terms of what they were emphasizing and stressing and trying to accomplish. And he said, uh, my goodness, if, if, if these are what the so-called experts have to say about this stuff, maybe maybe us amateurs should get in on the game. And, and that is when he started to turn his attention to writing about, about racial controversies. And, um, uh, but for most of the 60s, it was, it, was, it, was, it was economic history. He says that he felt a, a duty to, to write about these racial controversies because there were things that needed to be said and, and too many other people were reluctant to say them. And, 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 and if, a, if a statement defines Thomas Sowell's scholarship, that might be it. <laughs> he is a straight shooter. He is someone, uh, like I said, with this empiricist mindset 
that um, he brings to, to his scholarship, no matter the topic. And he will follow the facts to their logical conclusion and report his findings, even if they are unpopular, even if they are politically incorrect. And when it came to writing about racial controversies, that got him, that got him into trouble with a lot of people. And I think that's one reason, um, you know, names like ta Coates and Ibram Kendi and Nicole Hannah-Jones are much better known than, than, than Thomas Sowell. Uh, he was canceled back then in the 70s when he began saying these politically incorrect things about racial controversies. And uh, academia and, and intellectual elites um, decided that um, uh, they were going to cancel him. And, and they've been uh, largely in fact, uh, effective in doing that. He, he has paid a price in terms of popularity and notoriety, um, and which is a shame because of, you know, he, his non-racial writings deserve to be <laughs> deserve to be better known as well. But it is because of those of weighing in on those racial controversies, I think, that that, that has really cost him. In discussing his time in the university and amongst the intellectuals, like you, you kind of highlight this extremely important part of Thomas Sowell's thought, which is the way he views the intellectual class and, and how they derive their opinions. And also, I think in particular, how they regard other people, or maybe disregard would be a, a better term, but how they how they think about other people. So can you kind of go more into like the you see it a vision of the anointed for example <clears throat> which was a hugely influential book on me uh but how he kind of you said he was canceled but like he also took his canceling by the intellectual class and incorporated it into his philosophy and wrote about the way these people think essentially his observation um is that we need to view the intellectual class, like we would view any special interest group with its own agenda. Uh, uh, their agenda is ideas uh, and, and, and influence in, 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 in the political realm and, 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 and uh, academia and so forth. But they are uh, on just another special interest group and they need to be viewed as such. Um, uh, and, 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 and we don't view them skeptically enough. And this is uh, something he, he gets at in Knowledge and Decisions, um, where he's building on Hayek's uh, skepticism of, of, of intellectuals and, um, uh, and how they can't know more um, uh, than, than the collective body of a society, um, uh, no matter how smart they are. Um, so um, uh, Tom, Tom is sort of built on that, on that Hayekian view um, that we need to be skeptical of intellectuals. Um, in terms of being canceled, you know, one one of the uh, one of the patterns I, I I discovered in researching the book, uh, watching um, a lot of interviews that Tom had done over the decades, is that he would often be asked by um, uh, the interviewer, uh, you know, how does it feel to to go against the grain of so many blacks, um, and and Tom would say. Um, You'd correct the premise. You'd say, you know, I, I don't, I don't go against the grain of, of most blacks. Um, I go against the grain of black elites, black intellectuals. And he said, black intellectuals no more represent the average black person than white intellectuals represent the average white person. And 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 you know, you can't conflate, you can't conflate the two. So a lot of these black elites, uh, and 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 you see this today. Um, uh, whether we're talking about something like uh, school choice which is supported by, by most blacks, but opposed by black elites. Um, whether we're talking about you know, voter ID laws, which are supported by most blacks, opposed by black elites. Uh, racial preferences in college admissions are opposed by most blacks, supported by most black elites, so down the line. Um, and critical race theory, which is basically you know, uh, a, 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 a dressed up argument and fancy language for affirmative action and racial preferences. That's all really critical race theory is. And it's no surprise that a lot of black elites uh, support it because affirmative action, to the degree that it helps anyone, helps people that are already better off, even though it's sold in the name of helping uh, the poor and the underclass and so forth. So so black elites have long defended affirmative action. It helps them. And uh, they've attacked Thomas Sowell for critiquing affirmative action and calling out the fact that it tends to help people who are already better off. Um, so again, there, that, that, that's an example that Tom would use of these elites 
having their own agenda and, and that we need to be very skeptical um, uh, before we swallow what they're saying whole and, and, and look at their credentials and ask no questions. One of the criticisms in line with that, though, that, that Seoul frequently gets from black intellectuals and just intellectuals on the left is that his the way that he talks about civil rights and race issues is, if not an apology for racism, but a at least kind of dismissal or minimizing of the impact that America's racial history has had on Black Americans and continues to have on Black Americans. Is that, is there anything, is there, is that a fair critique or is it, does it completely miss the base? Like, does he, is he kind of just saying racism is not as bad as you say it is? No, I think it's a willful distortion of what Seoul has been, has been saying. And, 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 you know, if you're on the left, um, and and refuse uh, and believe that that racism is a blanket explanation uh, for uh, disparities today. Uh, anyone who disagrees with you is painted as someone who is apologizing or or uh, or, or minimizing the impact of racism. It's really an all or nothing attitude that the left has. Thomas said racism is one of many factors that can explain uh, disparate outcomes among groups. Um, uh, and the other side is saying, um, no, uh, racism is the factor and our goal should be to rid society of racism. And but for racism, we would not have uh, these disparities that we see today. And then that's when Seoul's empiricism kicks in. And he says, well, let's put that to the test. Um, you know, uh, let's look at what was going on uh, among Blacks at a time when there was far more racism than there is today. Let's look at the Black family formation back then. Let's look at the rate at which Black incomes were growing, the rate at which Black home ownership was growing, the rate at which Blacks were increasing their years of education both in absolute terms and relative to whites. Uh, let's look at the rate at which blacks were entering the skilled professions um, during Jim Crow, when racism was legal and widespread. And then let's compare that to uh, more recent times when there's clearly less racism, if nothing else, uh, legal segregation uh, no longer exists. Um, and uh, uh, Tom just says, let's wave evidence. Let's look at the evidence. And, and, and because the other side is wedded to this narrative that everything we see today is a legacy of slavery and a legacy of Jim Crow, they have to ignore this earlier period that Tom would use to compare and contrast the effects of racism per se. And then Tom would even broaden it. He'd say, you know, one of Tom's, uh, one way he's distinguished himself as a scholar is through his international comparisons. He doesn't just look at what's gone on here in America. And, and only among Blacks, he's looking at, at what's happened to other groups. Blacks are not the only groups who've been uh, uh, discriminated against, hated, disparaged in society. And, and what is the track record among other ethnic and minority groups uh, who have been treated similarly or in similar ways at different periods of time? And what has been their impact? What has been the impact of that treatment on their economic advancement? And if you look at you know Japanese, uh, experience in the U.S., a time when they you know, couldn't own land in certain states, uh, couldn't work in certain professions, were interned during World War II. Um, today, Japanese Americans uh, out-earn white Americans uh, and outperform white Americans academically and have for decades. Um, you could take the example of uh, the, the uh, ethnic Chinese in Southeast Asia, again, a hated group, locked out of certain professions. Uh, 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 certain schools, certain programs, um, yet again, uh, outperform the majority population uh, that discriminates against them to this day, outperforms them both academically and economically. Um, you could look at the example, of course, Jews in any number of countries around the world down through the ages who have done this. And then Tom would say, again, if, if racism or discrimination is an all-purpose explanation 
a satisfactory explanation for the outcomes we see among blacks today, how do you explain the experiences of these other groups? Um, and if you don't like comparisons to, to, to other groups, immigrants, and think the black experience is unique, then he says, okay, then let's, let's compare what was going on in black America in previous uh, generations versus what's going on today. Um, so, so Tom approaches this empirically. I, I think the other side has uh, not only um, a personal agenda uh, involved in what they're saying to, uh, to cover themselves, but also it's just simply ideologically wedded to a, a narrative that um, you know, gives people uh, emotional release um, and um, um, provides them with scapegoats. And, and Tom, um, I think, is, is, is looking at this more dispassionately, as is his want when it comes to these topics. And I, I, I frankly you know, prefer that. These are, these are topics that need uh, more light than heat. And, and Tom is about providing light. Some people have argued to me um, that one of the problems with Sola's work in this area is that for real racists, uh, for people who are actually racists, who would prefer to blame the race for ills, um, Thomas Sowell provides them kind of cover, essentially, that he gives them the ability to, like, because he himself is an African-American economist, and so that like gives them cover but like racists can use his work uh to be more almost more effective racists but underlying that they are just racists um does that is that a critique that's even like meaningful or valid or is it just is it just off base it's it's something he's experienced for a long time um i think it's a cop-out i mean the the one of the earliest uh, one of the first times he experienced this was when he did uh, pioneering research on race and IQ back in the uh, 1970s. And Sowell's interest at the time was to take on the scholarship of uh, a social scientist named Arthur Jensen, who had written that uh, outcomes today are largely explained through genes, genetic, it's hereditary. And therefore, Jensen was arguing that, you know, programs meant to address the achievement gap in school, say, like Head Start. Jensen said, these are, these are useless because this is genetic. Um, and, 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 and Sol wanted to take that on. There were other people who just wanted to call Jensen names. Um, Sol didn't believe Jensen was, was correct, but he wanted to test what Jensen was saying. Um, uh, and he did. He collected tens of thousands of, of IQ scores from going back to World War I. And um, he noticed some things that really undermined Jensen's genetic explanation for uh, differences in group outcomes. You had uh, uh, all black schools outperforming all white schools on standardized tests. You had black women um, overrepresented among all people with the highest IQs. Uh, you had black orphans raised by white families with above average IQs and on and on. There were just, there, there, it, all of this ran against Jensen's genetic genetic theory of, 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 of achievement gaps and, and, and intelligent gaps and so forth. Uh, the, the, and, and, and the one other thing that he noticed, and this is something that, um, that uh, the political scientist James Flynn would pick up later and become famous for the Flynn effect. Tom noticed that um, a group's IQ could rise in a few generations. In fact, it could rise more than the gap between groups which again argued that uh, something uh, envir uh, involving the environment was, was playing a bigger role than genetics because genes don't, don't work that fast within a generation or two. Um, they don't adapt that fast. So, so, uh, so Tom took this research he had done and presented it to Jensen and Jensen's supporters. And that's how he took on Jensen. And, and by the way, when Murray, Charles Murray did the same thing two decades later. Tom did the same thing <laughs> to Charles Murray <laughs> on the same grounds. He had, he, had, he had done all this research decades earlier to address Jensen's claims. But Tom's argument, and, and I think it's an important one, is um, when, when it comes to things like, like intelligence and, and what racists say about blacks, uh, Tom says, you know, you can't be afraid of what you might find. He said, I didn't know what I was going to find. 
I, I, I didn't think Jensen was right, but I wanted to be absolutely sure. Uh, and, and I wasn't afraid to find out. He thinks you know, there, were, there were a number of black academics that approached him when he was doing his research and, and, and urged him to stop for the reasons you just said. They were afraid of what he might find and how the racists would be able to use it. Tom uh, was not fearful of what he might find. And he said, you know what, though? Even if I do find what they fear the most, what are we, what are we supposed to do? Hide it? Well, he says, if you want to help, uh, if you want to help people, you need to know where they are. Wherever you want them to go, they need to get there from where they are, not where we're going to pretend they are. And if you you get rid of tests, and we're still having this debate with SA, SAT scores, people want to eliminate the SAT test because of the racial uh, disparate outcomes. Well, that, that's not going to eliminate the gap. You eliminate the test, you don't eliminate the gap. You just obscure the gap. And, and who is that helping? And, and, and Tom took the same approach when it came to this race and IQ debate. We need to know where people are if we want to help them, because they can only get where they want to go from where they are. And uh, uh, so, so I, I, I think that argument is a cop out. It's a, it's a cowardly uh, argument to take. If, 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 if you, and, 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 it's, and it's an anti-intellectual approach and it's a non-scholarly approach. Uh, present your evidence if you think someone's wrong. You know, calling people names, ad hominem attacks is not scholarship. It's not brave. It's cowardly. Take on those arguments if you think they're wrong. And that's what, that's what Tom did. Sol has written, let's just say, a lot of books over his career. And one of them, though, the one that I think a lot of people consider to be his masterpiece is Knowledge and Decisions. Can you tell us what that book is about? Sure. Uh, this is a book that uh, was inspired by an essay by, by Friedrich Hayek uh that ran in um in a in an academic journal uh in the 1940s and Sol had been assigned the uh the article in milton friedman's class when he was uh, studying for his phd uh the title of it was the use of knowledge in, in society and tom had no idea why friedman would, would assign this this uh this article uh for to uh to students studying price theory, uh, which is the course that he was taking from Friedman. Um, uh, you know, he read it, it didn't make much of an impression on him. But later on, um, when he was uh, teaching, um, he had to uh, teach a course on uh, the Soviet economy. Uh, someone thought he should teach this course because he knew a lot about Marx and wasn't really related. But he had to, he had to crash on, on the Soviet economy. And he starts reading up on what was going on. Uh, uh, in the Soviet Union at the time, and, and he made him think back to that Hayek article that he'd been assigned in, in Friedman's class. And he said, um, th there was a knowledge problem in, uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, and that, that was really the root of their problem. Uh, uh, the people with the knowledge didn't have the power, and the people with the power didn't have the knowledge. And, um, uh, and what Hayek was, was, was doing was really carry on the work of uh, von Mises, his his mentor, uh, uh, and 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 you know who was carrying on the work of Adam Smith in return. So Adam Smith is talking about the importance of uh, division of labor in a in a in a working economy. Uh, Hayek said there's also a, a division of knowledge problem that we need to focus on. And uh, and, and 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 what Sol did was to take take. Uh, Hayek's work in new directions in that book, Knowledge and Decisions. And, um, um, and Hayek was, was quite impressed by what Tom had done with his work. He said he, he wrote a, a glowing review of the book for uh, Reason Magazine um, back in 1980. Uh, and and it's, it's fascinating uh, to read because he starts the review by saying, when the, first, when the book came in the mail, I put it aside because I was too busy with my own research. He, he says, and when I finally picked it up, I realized that I should not have put this aside, that I would have made far more rapid progress on my own research had I read Tom's book first. Now, you think about it, this is 1980. Friedrich Hayek is already Friedrich Hayek in 1980. He's already got his Nobel. He's already known as one of the foremost uh, 
uh, political philosophers and economists in the 20th century. And then he goes on to talk about how Tom took this in directions he had never even imagined. Uh, it, it's, it tells you the high praise that Tom received among people in his discipline, that, that he is someone worthy of study, uh, even if he had never written a single word about affirmative action. Thomas Sowell is someone we would still be talking about because of his work in other areas. And uh, I think Hayek's praise of him, of him speaks to that. But, but basically the book is about um, how knowledge develops and how it spreads through society. Um, it's, it's, uh, the, uh, and, and how there are these decision-making units that are essential to the spread of knowledge. And that uh, to the extent that decisions are made um, uh, further and further away from the person who must live with the consequences of those decisions, society goes astray. And so uh, like Hayek worried about top-down, you know, command and control economies, uh, Seoul was worried about that as well. And was worried about the trends in society in terms of uh, these decisions being made by folks who will pay no consequences for being wrong, whether those are economic decisions, political decisions, decisions being made by the judiciary, and so forth. But Tom was worried about the trends away from uh, the person who will suffer the consequences. And, and the, the book has been quite prescient in terms of, if you read that book, it holds up very, very well um, uh, in terms of the trends it was pointing out uh, you know, 40, 40 something years ago. I think a lot of people who have the free market, a free market bent, uh, uh, my, myself, like have a story about Thomas Sowell or in some sort of thing that you read from him where you said, whoa, uh, you know, at some point in your life. And for me, I, for example, I was probably 12 years old and I was giving my dad grief about how we weren't recycling enough. And my dad gave me a, a Thomas Sowell column. And not necessarily the most normal family, but uh, there was a line in this column and it was, how do you know the difference between trash and a resource? And that, and that line made me be like, whoa, okay, that's pretty hmm. profound. Uh, yeah. And that's the way T Thomas Sowell does. He like asks these questions that like make you re even conceptualize recycling, right? Do you have one of those? Uh, and, and like, you, you have one of these sort of moments where you picked up and you're like, whoa, like, do you have one of those? There, there are so many, uh, there, there's, um, you know, Soul's not on, on Twitter. He's not on social media, but there's a fan account, uh, uh at Thomas Soul. And, um, all it does is, is publish quotes from old soul books and columns. He doesn't embellish them in any way, direct quotes. Um, and he, obviously there's a character limit on Twitter. So this guy has gone around uh, and found these little nuggets, these little gems. He tweets them out. The, the, uh, he's, got, he's got more than 700,000 followers. <laughs> People think it's Thomas Saul and they think it's stuff he's writing about what's going on right now. This is all old. <laughs> Thomas Soul stuff that is still relevant <laughs> to what we're talking um, ab ab about today. Um, Soul's what what I found most profound about Soul is his outside the box thinking. He'll, he'll say things. I'll give you a couple examples. One interview about poverty, and 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 Soul says we spend a lot of time talking about the causes of poverty. He says. But poverty is the natural state. Most countries are poor. Um, what we need to do is study why a few of them become rich. <laughs> that's 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 what we should be interested in, uh, not why countries are poor. <laughs> um, uh, another thing that that grabbed me is so many of our discussions about uh, inequality today um, rest on the assumption that equal outcomes are in fact the norm. And therefore, where we see inequality, unequal outcomes, disproportionate outcomes, something is amiss, something nefarious is going on. Solis pointed out, in fact, that inequality is the norm. People who have studied society's 
down through history have never found anything approaching proportionate outcomes among groups or representative outcomes among groups. So, so this, this state of affairs that is held out today as the norm <laughs> is something you don't find anywhere down through history in any society. Uh, not in America, not outside of America, not today, not yesterday, not a thousand years ago. Um, and and, and it, it sounds like a simple observation, but in fact, um, it's quite profound because so many of our discussions are premised on something that has never existed being the norm. <laughs> and, 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 and so uh, that that is an insight that I've I've. Uh, 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 that jumped out at me from Tom that informs, um, uh, you know, a lot of the scholarship. Yeah. Something I was going to say, like, uh, as a redhead, um, we could take the percentage of redheads in society. And if that was equally represented in all professions, that would be deeply weird. Like, right. It would be very <laughs> weird if that became a true well, thing. And, 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 uh, and he says, <laughs> you know, particularly in a place like America, why would you expect to find these proportionate outcomes, given that uh, we've taken in people from all over the world, different societies, different geographic locations, people from cultures with different attitudes towards school, schooling and, 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 and work and, 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 and all kinds of, why would you put them all together in the United States of America and then expect to see similar outcomes uh, given these different cultures they, they've all come from? One example he's used, um, uh, now that I think about it, that that I found quite remarkable, is um, he said uh, uh, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan uh, during the uh, periods of high immigration, you, you'd you'd have all these kids in the in the same school. So you'd have the Italians sitting next to the Jewish kids, sitting next to the Irish kids, um, and people would say, "Well, same school, same teacher. Um, why aren't they getting the same outcomes? Why aren't they getting the same grades?" Uh, and Sol would say, well, you have to realize that uh, the Jewish kid comes from a culture. Uh, uh, he's fleeing Russia, czarist Russia, where most of the country is illiterate. Most of the population is illiterate, but most Jews have books in their home, <laughs> even there. <laughs> and he's sitting in that class next to an Italian kid who probably came from southern Italy, or his family did, where when compulsory school attendance laws were put in place, schoolhouses were burned down because the parents wanted those kids working. That was more important than them getting an education. So technically they're in the same environment sitting next to each other in that class, but if you realize all the cultural baggage they are bringing with them to this country, um, they are not really in the same environment. They don't come out of the same traditions or the same culture. And, 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 and when they go home and return to, to, to that culture, um, uh, uh, you're going to get, you're going to get different outcomes and it really shouldn't surprise anyone. So, um, uh, that, that, there, there's an observation that I, that I found from Tom that I, that I thought was quite insightful. So we're going to open up for, uh, for questions here. Uh, we can, tweet at in the hashtag of Cato events, but also Facebook, YouTube. Uh, uh, first one here, uh, we're going to do from Thomas Grins, I think is the right way of putting it, a professor of economics. Uh, he asks, Thomas Sowell has received little recognition within the economics profession, perhaps because his work is broader than just ec economics. Has his work gotten any greater recognition in other disciplines, such as, say, sociology, anthropology? Um, and if not, why not? Well, um, his early work in economic history did, and that's why I was citing uh, Hayek. Um, and, and, you know, that was one of many examples. I mean, James Buchanan, uh, the Nobel Prize winner, um, sent Sol a note after reading Knowledge and Decisions that said something like, um, uh, I wish I had written this book. And I don't think I've ever said that about uh, another book that I've read. Um, um, I mean, he, he was, he was, his, his work on, on, on economics uh, and economic history in particular was widely praised. Tom was published uh, uh, in all the prestigious academic journals, uh, published when he was in academia, um, he worked in economics departments where he was publishing more than anyone in the department. And in some cases, more than, than, than all of them combined. Uh, 
I mean, he, he was he, he was a first rate scholar and he was recognized as such at the time. Uh, as I was saying earlier, I think it is his weighing in on racial controversies that has cost him in terms of prestige, in terms of notoriety about uh, his writings in these uh, in these other areas. He's essentially been canceled to uh, to use today's today's jargon. Um, He's not as well known as he should be on his writings on other areas, even though, again, um, uh, I, I, I think um, uh, he's outperformed people who are better known known than him. I think his scholarship in terms not only his breadth, how uh, voluminous it's been, but just his range and his depth. Uh, one, one scholar uh, called him one of the great intellectual trespassers that we have his ability to move between disciplines. He's not just an economist. He's a, an historian, a social theorist, a political philosopher, a sociologist. And, and to watch him uh, move between these fields and these writings, sometimes within the same book, is, is really just something to behold. Um, but no, he hasn't, he hasn't received the recognition uh, that I think he deserves, which is one of the reasons I wanted to, uh, to write the book. Richard Malaby asks, did you learn anything surprising about either Thomas Sowell himself or his scholarship as you were doing the research for this book? Well, I, I'd been following Tom's writings for, for a while. I, I discovered him um, uh, uh, not as young as, as you guys, but in the game, how old were you, 14? He said 11. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't quite that young. But, um, I, I was 12, I, like 12 um, or 13. 12. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, 12. I, I waited a little longer. Um, but... Um, I, I discovered him in college. I, I worked on, on the school newspaper and was having a conversation about um, affirmative action with, with some of my colleagues on the paper one day. And, and someone said to me, Jason, you sound like Thomas Sowell. And I said, Thomas who? And he wrote down the name of a book uh, on a sheet of paper. I went to the school library uh, that, that afternoon, checked it out, read it in one sitting that evening, and then went back the next day and checked out the rest of my college's uh, Thomas Sowell collection and, and, and uh, have been hooked ever since. I first got to meet Sowell um, in the mid 90s when I was uh, on the staff of the Wall Street Journal working on the editorial page. And he would come through New York on book tours and meet with editorial boards. And uh, later on in the mid 2000s, I, I went out to Hoover at Stanford University to write up a profile of him for the newspaper. And we sort of struck up an acquaintance that, that has endured. So I've been following him. I've been reading him a, a, a lot uh, uh, for a long time. And, and so there wasn't too much that, that, was, that was really surprising. I think for, for others, um, as I, something I mentioned earlier, which is how late a start he got, uh, might, might, might surprise a lot of people given how, how prolific he's been. Uh, uh, last year, he published his, I believe it's his 37th book um, and his fifth since turning 80. Um, so he has been just extremely, extremely uh, uh, prolific. Um, and, and, I, 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 and, and, and again, um, he's written some of them for his peers. Most of them he's written, however, for the general public. And I think uh, the clarity of his writing, his accessibility is, is something uh, that, that continues to appeal to people. An anonymous questioner uh, asks whether or not uh, for Sowell's own, in his own estimation, uh, is there something that he's more proud of relative to other things that, that he, in terms of a book he done or a specific area that he's pursued? Um, is there something that yeah. he's maybe more proud of than other ones? His favorite book is A Conflict of Visions. And, uh, and, and, and if you want to get inside of Thomas Sowell's head, um, it's, it's the book to read. It's a book about, um, history of ideas. And, and, and frankly, it, 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 it's about how many of our disputes uh, about social issues and political issues today boil down to differing concepts of, of human nature and how the world works. And, 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 and Sol sort of breaks this down into two broad visions that people have, and they're in conflict. He calls them the unconstrained vision and the constrained vision. Uh, sometimes the unconstrained vision is called the utopian vision and the constrained vision is called the the tragic vision uh and, and so someone with this constrained view of human nature uh believes that there are limits to to, to human human betterment that that mankind is, is flawed hopelessly 
flawed. And so the best thing that we can, we can do in society is to set up institutions and processes that, that help us deal with problems that we're never going to solve entirely. Uh, so, you know, you may want world peace. Uh, you, you, you may want to end racism or prejudice but it's probably not gonna happen. So you probably do need to build a military defense. You probably do need a, a, a court system to adjudicate various disputes in society. It won't be perfect, but um, uh, given that you're not gonna end crime and you're not gonna end war, we need to put in place institutions that help us deal with certain trade-offs that need to be made. And he contrasts that view of the world with this unconstrained view, this view that says um, there are no limits. Uh, we, we, we can not only manage these problems, we can solve them. It just, it's just a matter of, 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 of using reason and, and willpower. Uh, but, but these problems can be vanquished. And, and, and Tom says, you know, uh, depending on, 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 on which vision you hold, um, it's going to explain a lot of what you believe and everything from, from, from tax cuts to environmentalism to antitrust law. And he, he, he finds patterns. Some, sometimes I use music lyrics to to sort of illustrate the the different the different vision. So when, when John Lennon is singing about world peace, that is utopian. That is the, you know, that, 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 is, that is utopian. But but when when Mick Jagger sing, sings you can't always get what you want, that is the more constrained view of, of human nature. Uh, you know, pretty pretty much anything by Stevie Wonder is hopelessly unconstrained. Beautiful music, but but it's utopian. Uh, but when Meatloaf sings two out of three ain't bad, there's your there's your constrained vision of, of, of human nature. So sometimes that's how I, that's how I break it down. But so these are his favorite books. And if, and if you want to understand where he is coming from uh, on, on anything he's writing about, from, from economics to history, to race and culture, this is the framework he is operating within. And he lays it out in this book. And he says it's, it's his favorite because it's all his own. It's not building on, on the works of others, uh, to the extent that, say, a Knowledge and Decisions book was. But uh, it's, it's, it's something that he came up with as a way uh, to, 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 frame, to frame these debates. And it's actually part of an informal trilogy of books. The, the first one is called The Conflict of Visions. And then after that, he came out with a book called The Vision of the Anointed. And the third one is called The Quest for Cosmic Justice. And the second two, he goes into more a critique of the various visions. Um, and those, those books are a little more polemical as a result. But in the original, A Conflict of Visions, he's just laying out the framework. He doesn't hide the fact that he has, shares a more tragic view, but he's, he's more interested in just uh, framing, framing these issues and, and, and coming up with a, a template for, for, um, for analyzing them. As Trevor mentioned, Souls had a tremendous influence on a lot of people, I think all of us on this in this event right now. And so for our final question, I think this is a good one. Soul with knowledge and decisions and some of the books that followed on from it kind of picked up Hayek's project and ran with it, developed it further. And so this questioner asks, are there writers out there today who are doing something similar with Soul? Are there people who have inherited his legacy and are taking it forward? Um. I'd, I'd have two answers to that. Oh, there, there are, um, but many of them are 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 are, are academics that are, don't have the public profile of Thomas Sowell. Um, they're sort of toiling in relative obscurity, uh, you know, churning out academic books and so forth. Um, you know, you have people at like George Mason who who care about this stuff and, and write about this stuff, um, and and you saw people at the University of Chicago. Um, uh, that that care about this stuff, but no one with Tom with Tom's profile. So th there are people who exist. They're 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 not well known enough, and and I'd argue there aren't enough of them. And um, and and I uh, that concerns me. You know, the souls. It, it, you know, it, it gets to one of the uh, critiques of soul that I I came across uh, while I was researching the book. And that is that uh, there's a debate among some people um, on whether Sol should have stuck it out in academia. Uh, you know, he he leaves in 1980 and goes to Hoover, and that's where he's been uh, ever since. And we've gotten the books, and we've gotten the columns, and and um, 
and it's great, but the trade-off is that we don't have hundreds or thousands of graduate students that would have studied under Thomas Sowell and may be out there proselytizing in, in ways that some of us would, have, would really appreciate. So there has been a trade-off. Um, I don't know that I, I would trade all the books and the columns for it, but I, there, there is something to that, to that argument, I think. Well, thank you. And thank you to all of you out there for sending in your great questions. We had a lot of them and I apologize that we couldn't get to all of them, but video of this recording will be available on the Cato Institute's webpage and as an upcoming episode of our Free Thoughts podcast. And thank you, Jason, for the good conversation, important book. And thank you to all of you for joining us. Thank you.